Proverbs chapter 20. Sometimes Proverbs are given in couplets, so you might have two verses in our Bibles that are linked together as the one proverbial truth. There are some sections, obviously, in Proverbs that are, that are more lengthy, a chapter or a major section where all the verses are connected and the thought is there. But for a good amount of the book of Proverbs, there are single, succinct statements of generalized truth, and such is the case for us this morning. We're going to look at just one verse, and that's verse 7 of Proverbs chapter 20. Let me read it for us, please. The writer of Proverbs, probably Solomon here speaking and writing, says this, The just man walketh in his integrity, his children are blessed after him. So we look at this uh, simple proverb, I, I took as uh, my thought from it in my title this morning, The Potential Blessing of Fatherhood. And I say potential because, again, Proverbs, as we'll say in just a moment as we get into the message, many of you know this, are generalized truths. They're not declarations of what always happens, but they are, fortunately, reminders of what typically happens in given situations. I also say potential because in this situation, we're dealing with two different lives. We can have the father and we have then the children. And while the father may be doing everything that God asked him to do, the child still does have decisions and choices that they're going to make. So it isn't a guarantee, but it is a generalized truth that I think we can get great comfort and encouragement and challenge from this morning, and that's my hope. So as we look at this verse and we, call, we look to it and are thinking along the potential blessing of fatherhood, let's go to God himself and ask him to help us to receive what, he needs, what we need this morning from this text. Father, again, we come to you this morning praying for your favor. Lord, this is your word. Obviously, there was a man that wrote this, uh, but he wrote it under the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. You tell us that in the Bible. Therefore, we know that the truth that he wrote, even while being a generalized truth, is an accurate truth. It is not just the reasonings of one man. It is the declaration of you, dear God, and so we should look at it in, in that form. We know that when you've left us things in your eternal word, Lord, you've left it for our edification. You've left it for our sanctification. Uh, Lord, you are using your word ultimately to bring about the completion of our salvation. And so, Lord, understanding this, the value, the worth, the power of your word, Lord, it would behoove each of us this morning to, to stop and give our undivided attention to what you are saying here and asking you, Maybe even here at the outset, what do you have to teach me? We will be speaking primarily to fathers this morning out of this verse, but the truth would apply to any individual. May we all see that. Certainly, I would not expect anyone who's not a father to feel like they can just turn off this time, uh, Lord, because they're not a father. Certainly, it's your word. We all need to give heed to it. That's the way we uh, honor it and worship you. So, Lord, may that be the case. Spirit of God, move in our midst, we pray. Accomplish your will in me and in others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a commercial several years ago. Um, I lose track of time, probably quite a few years ago, but maybe it's still running. I don't know. I don't watch network TV. I don't see commercials anymore. But it was uh, one of the commercials that is, you know, there were over my lifetime, there's been many commercials trying to challenge people to give up smoking. I think it's probably put out by the National Lung or Heart Association or whatever. But in this particular one, it was showing a teenage girl whose father had passed away from lung cancer, and obviously given who was funding it, it, because he had had lung cancer, because he had been a smoker all his life. And in this commercial, she's lamenting, she's looking back, and she's lamenting all the things that she was now unable to share with her father because he had succumbed at a relatively young age to a death that at least could be attributed to the fact that he had unwisely uh, smoked and had done great damage to his physical body. And at the end of the commercial, the statement that they ended with was this, if you won't quit smoking for yourself, quit for those you love. Now, those type of commercials never mean anything to me personally. I never was a smoker, praise the Lord. I wasn't and, and was not tempted or desirous to do that. But that particular commercial, every time I saw it, it still had an impact on me. And the impact was in that final statement. That statement could apply to a lot of areas of life. 
Basically, anything that we should do that would be wise for us to do, that would be good to us, the challenge was what? If you're a, if you're a parent, if you're somebody who has others that are looking up to you, depending upon you, others who love you and that you love as well, then the question was what? Or the statement was what? If you won't do it for yourself, and you know that seems kind of strange in itself because we're so self-serving. It's like, why wouldn't we do what is best for us? But we know we don't. I don't always do what's best for me. But they were trying to reach beyond that and say, if you won't do it for yourself, do it for the one that you love. There is a real sense in which our own personal choices and actions do have long-lasting repercussions on other people. And especially, we know this, right? Although I think sometimes we purposefully dismiss it because we don't like to face that reality. The people that our lives have the most impact in are the lives of those that we love the most, the people who are, who are close to us, the people, obviously, in most cases, who would live in our own household, they are the ones that our lives are impacting the most. I can just say this from personal experience. When I'm in the throes of temptation, <laughs> we were talking about that this morning as we read in 1 Corinthians, I get tempted to sin just like you do. And when I'm in the throes of temptation and I'm, I'm, I'm desirous to engage in some disobedient behavior, I have to confess it hasn't, doesn't always stop me. But it has often been the case that the reason I didn't move forward in that temptation was the thought that captivated me that this sin, if I engage in it, has the potential to have serious consequences on people that I very much love and care for. I think there are times when we would be willing to suffer the consequences of our sins, sinful actions ourselves, but when we stop and think, but those actions could negatively impact my wife. Those actions could negatively impact my children. Those actions could negatively impact my church, my extended family. We might give pause and perhaps, hopefully, make a choice to not engage in that activity. So it's often been those realities that there are people I love and care about who are going to be impacted by my choices that have at least helped me to rein in the lust of my flesh. I'm thankful for that. And I think the, the people who made that commercial, more than likely, were not Christians, but they just understood there is a natural affection out there, and let's use it to our advantage. Being a father is an incredible thing. There's a lot of pride in the sense of being able to be a father. But, you know, from the first time our firstborn was Brittany, from the first time we're in the hospital and you see this new life that God has brought into your family and you're, you're excited and you're thrilled about that, it didn't take very long for the responsibility of that to begin to weigh very heavily on me. One of the most frightening things for me in my life has been watching my children grow up for this reason, <laughs> that I see so much of myself in them. Many of the weaknesses that my children have are my weaknesses. Many of the struggles that my children face are my struggles. And it is sobering. I would think any father here this morning would probably attest to that. It is sobering to see your weaknesses and your failures and your sins prevalent in the lives of your children. Now, that is a sobering thought, and I guess we could say it's a negative thought. I really don't want to be negative this morning because our text is not negative. It's actually positive. But we do have to understand that reality, that potential of danger here. But I like the way the proverb is written because Solomon here is actually taking this truth that we've just discussed and shown the reality of, and he's flipped it on its head. While there, yes, is the potential for us to have a negative impact in the lives of our children, our proverb this morning reminds us there is also a great potential to have a positive impact in the lives of our children. That's why I'm calling this, it is the potential of fatherhood. And I hope, mothers, you realize this is the same potential you have. If we were preaching this on Mother's Day, it would be appropriate for you. But there, are, I'm someone who believes the Lord has called me to the pastorate, a, a job of shepherding others. And while my church congregation may be larger than my natural family, 
I've come to realize, and realize this early on, I will have probably no greater impact on any people more than I will have on my own personal family. My wife and my children, they are the ones that I'm closest to. They're the ones I spend the most time with. They're the ones that see the real me all the time. And so I have this incredible opportunity to impact them. So this is the potential, uh, positive potential of fatherhood. And on this Father's Day Sunday, that's what I want to draw our attention to, and specifically to our fathers, but for all of us, because we do all have an opportunity to impact others. And I think it's important for us to think about those things as we look at what this verse is going to tell us. I mentioned it before I even read the proverb this morning, but I will just preface again. Proverbs are general truths. Most of us understand that when we think of proverbial statements that we just encounter in regular life or that we read in, in secular literature, but it seems like when it gets into biblical literature, somehow our thinking about Proverbs completely changes. It's like the idea of a proverb now becomes, oh my goodness, that truth, I can take that as a promise and run with it, and it's always going to come to pass. But biblical Proverbs are no different than the rest of the Proverbs that we understand. They are declarations of general truth. In this case, Solomon, who had a unique experience to observe much of life, says, as if I've observed life, I've seen these things to come true. Even this statement I'm about to make about the relationship that fathers can have upon their children. The nice thing about biblical Proverbs is this. We know that they actually do have the stamp of God's approval upon them because they have been given under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So again, it's not taking them to a new level saying, oh, well, since it's a biblical proverb, this always comes to pass. That's not what the Bible is trying to teach us here. It's still proverbial literature, but we do know that the proverb here is sound because God himself has stated it. It is something we can look at and can give serious consideration to because it is part of the words of life. And so that's what I would challenge us with this morning, that we look at it in this way. As we said, biblical proverbs are Solomon's observations of life, general truths that Solomon has found to be consistent in their occurrence. So we need to look at them and ask ourselves, what would God be teaching me here this morning? We do need to understand that sometimes children living under the influence of a father, such as the type of father that Solomon is writing about in this proverb today, will go on and make life decisions that nullify all the potential blessing that was available to them, and they can become the exception to the proverbial rule. It's sad, but it happens. But I am thankful that we can read this proverb in Scripture and come away with it knowing that there is, God says, a cause and effect relationship of many of these proverbial truths, and certainly the one that we'll consider this morning. There can be a cause and effect between the way in which we as fathers rear our children and the impact that we'll have in their lives. So I'm going to approach this proverb in this way. I'm going to actually reword it in just a moment and make it similar to a thesis statement. And I'll state the statement, and then I'm going to break the statement into three component sections and seek to amplify and expound upon those three components. In writing, those of you that have ever written papers, you know that as you put forth your thesis, your thesis statement is a summation of what this paper is going to declare. And usually, many times, it's put forth as a pro propositional statement, and then you use the rest of your, your paper to prove and substantiate what it is that you have said. So in this case, I'm not going to seek to prove the reality of this thesis statement. I'm going to throw it out there for us as a declaration and ask each of us as dads and mothers and all of us to prove it ourselves in life. Solomon doesn't seek to prove it in this proverb. He just states the reality of these facts. The proof comes when we put it into practice and see the results. And I would challenge each of us this morning to think about what he says here, and it's simple. It's not going to take us long to understand what he's saying here. <laughs> but understand that this is a generalized truth concept that we can lay hold of and then look to God and say, God, would you prove the value, the worth of this in my own life, in my family, in my relationships with my children? That's my desire. So here's the way I'm going to form a thesis statement related to our verse here in Proverbs 20, verse 7. I'm going to state it this way. The right kind of father living the right kind of life places his children in a favorable position to receive God's manifold blessings. Let me say it again. The right kind of father living the right kind of life places his children in a favorable position to receive God's manifold blessings. Let's look at the proverb and consider its teaching this morning. Let's begin with that first point. 
the right kind of father. What does our proverb say? The just man is the description of our verse. So Solomon describes a type of man that he's speaking about in this particular proverb as a just man. The word translated just here is the Hebrew word sadik. It is the idea carries the idea of someone who is righteous, someone who is upright, someone who is innocent in accordance with God's proper standards. So as we begin thinking about this, this simple proverb this morning, I would just challenge us, dads, to start at the beginning. If we want to see the benefit of this proverb that we're looking at this morning, in order to be the kind of father that is spoken of in this proverb, we are going to have to be first and foremost just men, which we come to understand from the teaching of Scripture to mean that we are going to have to be Christian men. <laughs> we are going to have to be those who have been saved by the power of God through Jesus Christ. Now, the author of this proverb understood this himself. Solomon, who writes many of our proverbs, is also the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes. And it's in Ecclesiastes that this very same man makes this statement under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. <laughs> so the writer of this verse that makes this proverb understands there is no human being who in and of himself can live up to the standard here. There is no just man, he says, upon the earth. There's not a man who in himself does good and does not sin. The very same thing that the Apostle Paul went on to reiterate in Romans. We studied that many, many months ago in the early part of Romans chapter 3 when he said this, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. One. So the biblical reality is this, men. There are no just men upon the face of the earth. Well, that puts us in quite a predicament. The Proverbs here is telling us that this, the beauty of this truth in this proverb is the result of the outflow of just men. But this same Bible is telling us there are no just men. So who could ever see the truth of this proverb made a reality and their life. Well, it can only be a reality when those of us who are unjust are declared just and made just through our personal faith in Jesus Christ. At least three times in the scriptures, we are informed that the just live by faith. And because of mankind's innate sinfulness, he can only be declared just through faith in the provision that God himself has made for man's salvation. Now, some who are thinking of my first point this morning and saying the only people that can ever see this kind of outcome are a just person, and there are no just people in and of themselves apart from Christ, they may push back a little bit at that statement and say, I've known, or I presently know, some good people, people who are not Christians. But while we could debate that, and I'd be happy to do that at some point in time, there really is no need for debate because the Scriptures themselves correct that false assumption by revealing to, ourselves, to us that we must not dare compare ourselves to the wrong standard when we seek to determine what is just and what is good. There are good people in this world when we compare them to the rest of people. <laughs> There are people who do better things than other people. And there are people who do less bad things than other people. So comparing ourselves among ourselves, we could declare there are some that are good, and they may not even be Christians when we compare them by the standard of the rest of humanity, but that's not the standard we're compared by. The standard we're compared by is the standard that God the Creator has for humanity. And this is why for man to be able to attempt to live out the general truth of our proverb this morning, he's going to have to be a born-again man. He must have received the righteousness of God himself, and he must have the righteous Holy Spirit of God dwelling within him. So this morning as we consider this proverb, this thesis, the right kind of man is a just man, I would ask this this morning, fathers, and I would ask all of us present in this room because for this truth to happen in any of our lives in any form or fashion, this has to be true. Are we saved this morning? Have we personally turned from our sinfulness and put our faith and dependence in Jesus Christ? 
that's been kind of shocking over the years as I'm getting older in the faith and certainly been in the ministry for many years. It's shocking for me to sometimes realize it would appear, again, I can't see the heart, but it would appear by both statements and actions that there are people who could spend the majority of their life attending a church such as ours who are not even converted. Who do not even know the Lord as their personal Savior. And when you get an opportunity at some point to have a personal one-on-one conversation with those individuals, and you actually begin to pursue the issue of when was it that you turned from your sin personally? When was it that you personally trusted Christ as your Savior? And they don't really have an answer. I've been amazed the times that I've heard their answer to be this. Well, I've always believed in God. I've always believed in Jesus. Folks, I'm sorry to tell you this. That's not salvation. Salvation is something that occurs in our life at a particular period and point in our lifetime. It comes, the Bible says, usually. It doesn't always have to flow in these concise ways, but it always, in some sense, has to flow out of the reality of the fact that I am aware that I am a sinner. That in my life, I have been living this life that has been graciously granted to me by God himself. I have been living this life in direct disobedience to him. I have not gotten up every day and lived my day to the glory of God. In fact, for the most part in my life, I never think about God whatsoever, except when I need him for something. He doesn't control what I do. He doesn't occupy my thoughts. I'm not concerned about his righteous perspectives. I'm just living my own life. Oh, I may go to church because that's what expected of me. It might have been the way I was raised. It may be part of my culture. I might even have a Bible. And maybe I sit down and read it at times. I might even at times close my eyes and offer prayers to God. None of those things are salvation, folks. They may be the legitimate outflow of a saved person, but none of those things save us, and none of those things make us Christian. To become a Christian, there has to come a point in time in our lives where we understand that we are apart from God because of our sin, that we understand we have not been pleasing in His sight, when we understand actually that the wrath of God resides upon us because of our sin, and rightfully so. And we have come under the weight of that sin, the conviction of that sin, and we're, we're fearful of what that means because ultimately we know that this is separating us from God. Not only right now can I not have his blessing, but I can't know his blessing for all of eternity in this position. I come to understand this, and it burdens my soul, and I desire to be rid of it, and so I ask God, please, I turn from my sin, Father, and I want to be have a right relationship with you. And we know that that right relationship can only come because God in his grace and mercy has provided a way. It is through the sacrifice of his own son, Jesus Christ, who died in our place, who bore our sins upon the cross of Calvary. And we turn from our sin and we put our trust and dependence fully upon Jesus Christ by faith. Then and only then, according to the scriptures, are we justified. Then and only then are we truly a Christian. Then and only then... Are we genuinely saved? Dads, in accordance with our proverb this morning, then and only then are we a just man. Can we be the right kind of man? So I wonder this morning, dads, are you saved? Are you a Christian? If you're not, we really can't go any further in this proverb because none of it's going to help us. We have to first ourselves be rightly related to God, and that comes through our personal faith in Jesus Christ. I've got good news. If you know this morning you're not, if the Spirit of God has brought an awareness to you, maybe this morning like he did to me so many years ago, the Spirit of God is telling you you're not a Christian today. It's good that he's told you that. Because now that you're aware that you're not, you're in a position to become one. Because now you can understand how much you need Christ, and you can put your faith and dependence in him. And all those that call upon the name of the Lord, my Bible tells me, will be saved. You can be a just man today. And if you're not, trust Christ. (laughs) Do it. (laughs) There's no better thing that you could do. So we see this morning the right type of man. The right type of man, the right type of father is a just man. The second part of my thesis statement or my, my my. statement that I'm throwing out for our consideration is this. The right kind of man living 
the right kind of life. Let's go back to our proverb. The just man walketh in his integrity. So Solomon's proverb is speaking of a just man who is now walking in his integrity. The word integrity, the Hebrew word tom, means blamelessness, innocence, uprightness. Solomon is here describing how the just man lives his life. You know, the teaching of this proverb falls in line with the overarching revelation of Scripture. Nowhere in the Scripture are we going to find the endorsement, or even, I would dare say, the acknowledgement of something akin to possessing a faith that never changes us, a faith that does not work. The Bible is clear that those who have been made righteous by grace through faith, in other words, those who have received the Lord Jesus as their Savior, will then begin to exercise that new righteousness in their everyday lives. Paul, writing to the Ephesian Christians, says this, verses that we love, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Wonderful truth. Undeniable truth. But it doesn't stop there. He goes on to say to the same people that this is true of, For we, these that have been made just by faith, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we would walk in them. So Paul is saying what? If God has redeemed us, if he's made us just, he's made us just for a reason. Because he has good works for us to do. And now as just individuals, those who have been made just by our faith in Jesus Christ, there is that expectation that we will walk in them. Later in this same book of Ephesians, he says this in chapter 5, verses 8 through 21, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk in wa with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. What is Paul telling the Ephesian Christians? He's saying, listen, you were once darkness. You were once lost. You were once unjust. <laughs> But now you've been made just by your faith in Christ. So walk like it. Be children of the day, not people of the darkness. Don't walk like the heathen. Walk like what God redeemed you to be. Don't be drunk with wine where's in excess. In other words, don't allow something else to dominate and have control of your life, but allow the indwelling spirit of God to control and dominate you so that God himself is in control of your life. Folks, that's why he saved us. He saved us because He wants us to be His prized possession. And He wants to gain glory from our lives. I'm not to the practical part of the message, but are we getting it even right now, Dads? He didn't make you a father for your own purposes. He made you a father for His purposes. He didn't give you children to raise them according to your own whims and wishes. He gave you children to raise them for His glory and honor. It is His purposes that are supposed to dominate our daily lives. This is the calling. James in his epistle said it this way, Even so faith, if it hath works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God that doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also." You say, Pastor, how do I know I'm a Christian? I don't know. Do you see evidence of Christ in you? 
Do you see the transformation? I'm not talking about perfection. Oh, I wish it was perfection. And yes, praise God, perfection is coming. I'm just saying this. Do you see Christ in you at all? Is anything different? It has to be different if we actually are his. We have his nature. We have the spirit of God living in us. How could we continue to be the exact same person we were before we faith, put faith in Christ if now we truly have him living within us? The apostle Peter wrote it this way in his epistle, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What is it, folks? It really is the concept of we're going from glory to glory. When we receive the Christ as our Savior, yes, we, we are transformed in the sense that we have a new nature given unto us, born again in the nature of God. But as we've talked about so much in Romans, there is still a part of us that is yet to be redeemed. We're certainly not living in the utopian environment that God had created for his children to live in yet. So what is it for us in our daily sojourn right now? It is one of going from glory to glory. It is adding to our faith virtue and temperance and patience and all these other things, these fruit of the Spirit, the, the very life of God being made manifest in us on a day-by-day -day basis. God has not saved us and made us righteous through Christ so that our lives might remain as they were. God has given us new life in Christ so that old things would pass away and all things would become new. So the kind of man Solomon is speaking of here is, not, is a just, not just a man made just by God. He is a man who also walks in his integrity. In other words, Solomon says, he lives a righteous life. And because he's living a righteous life, it obviously sets him apart from those in the world who do not know God. On a practical level, this will mean that the father who is just, a father who walks as in integrity, will be a man whose life will be distinctively Christian. His outlook on life will be different from those around him who do not know Christ. His outlook on his marriage will be different. His understanding of who his wife is and his purposes with relationship to his wife are vastly different than the unsaved man. I'm not saying unsaved men can't love their wives and unsaved men can't appreciate their wives and unsaved men can't be kind to their wives. I'm not saying that at all. They can. But they don't understand why they do these things. They're certainly not doing them out of an understanding of who God is and what God created their marriage relationship to be and what he wants it to symbolize, which is actually the relationship of Christ to his church. They have no concept of this. And they certainly do not have the new nature or the wherewithal of the spirit to actually live this out. It is a transformation that comes upon a man who is just and is walking in his integrity. So his life will be different from others in his marriage. His family, the way he thinks about his children and what he wants for his children and the way he rears his children is going to be completely different than the unsaved man. He's going to have a different attitude about his occupation. He's going to be a man who understands, God expects me to do my best, to work hard, to be diligent in the things and affairs that he gives us. But at the same time, he balances that knowing that God himself has informed him that it isn't about this job completely. It isn't about this world because it's all going to burn up one day and be gone. That what really matters is what I'm doing for the kingdom. And so as much labor as he invests in this earthly realm, he's investing it actually for kingdom purposes. And he realizes that it's even greater the reason he does these things is to glorify God, his heavenly father. He's different in his hobbies and his pursuits. It's not that Christian people can't have enjoyments, that they can't be involved in certain things that maybe we would call secular. It's not that that can't be the case, but the, our attitude toward them is completely different than the unsaved person. 
is going to be different than his entertainments. What entertains him is going to be completely different than what entertains an unsafe person. His attitude concerning wealth will be different. Everything about him is to be impacted and will be impacted by the righteousness of Christ, which has been imparted unto him by faith. And this is where it gets a little bit both frightening and blessed when we understand that since, in this case, he's speaking to men who are husbands and fathers, then the choices that this man is making as a just man walking in his integrity is not just impacting him. Oh, no. His choices and his attitudes and his actions are impacting his wife. His choices and his attitudes and his actions are impacting his children. His children will not only witness his walk of integrity, they will be impacted by it, or the lack thereof. His choices in life will affect his wife and his children. His integrity, his uprightness will draw those under his authority along with him. All dads hearing this this morning and hearing me say these words would probably honestly admit, I don't always walk in my integrity. And if you're saying that to yourself or feeling that in your heart, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> because I don't always walk in my integrity either, much to my shame. But I can, can I encourage you with this thought? I haven't taken a poll of all the women and children in our congregation, but I feel pretty confident that this is the case. Your wife, if you're married, and your children, if you're a father, do not expect righteous perfection out of you. They don't expect it. Because if they're fair and they're honest with themselves, they know their own weaknesses and they know their own failings. They do not expect more out of you than what they are expecting out of themselves. But having acknowledged that, they do have a right to expect that you are giving an honest effort to try to walk in the integrity that God has placed before you as one of his children. They have a right to expect of us, husbands and fathers, that we will do our best to obey God's will and seek God's will in every way. They have a right to expect to see us pursuing righteousness on a regular basis. And they have a right to expect to see in us a true battle that we're waging against our own sinful flesh. And they also have this right. When we fail, and at times we will fail, guys, we're not perfect. We're going to fail at these times. But they have a right to expect when we fail to see us confess our sin for what it is, both to God and to them. They have a right to expect to see us ex asking and begging God for cleansing and forgiveness. And they have a right to expect to see us pick up where we fell and get back up on our feet by God's grace and start moving forward in a righteous way. They have a right to expect that. No honest wife or child is expecting perfection out of us dads and husbands. But they do have a right to expect us to honor God and try to follow in his footsteps. And they have a right to expect that when we fail, we admit we failed. We don't try to justify it and act like it doesn't matter or like it's okay. No, they have a right to expect that we come clean with God and ourselves and them. We failed. We blew it. We're sorry. We confess it for sin. Now we're going to try to do better by God's grace. They have a right to expect that. That's part of walking in integrity. The Apostle Paul, when speaking of himself, didn't say, I've mastered the Christian life. But as he was coming to the end of his life, he was able to say to Timothy, I did run a good race. <laughs> he, did, he was able to say, I fought a good fight. He did say, I'm intent on finishing this prescribed course that God has given me for his glory and honor. And this is really all that our wives and our children can expect of us as well. They can expect for us to attempt to get up each morning and to commit our lives to God that day and then to walk by God's grace in the pathway that his holy word has ordained for us. They have that right. God would say that can be their expectation. So for the reality of this proverb to come true, we have to have the right kind of father, a just man. He's born again. He's, he's made new by Christ. Living the right kind of life, walking in his integrity, seeking by God's grace to walk in the precepts that have been ordained for him as a child of God. And that brings us to the third part of this thesis statement. This places his children in a favorable position to receive God's manifold blessings. Isn't that what he says? The just man walketh in integrity. His children are blessed after him. The word blessed here, the word eser, 
carries the idea of fortune, happiness, a heightened state of happiness and joy implying favorable circumstances. Circumstances which often result from the kind acts of God being leveled upon them. Have you ever heard someone make this statement, or perhaps you've made it yourself, if this is your experience? I was so fortunate to have been raised in the home in which I was raised. In the margin of my Bible, I, I have written by this very verse, these words, Grandpa and Dad have left me a great heritage. I'm truly blessed. I'm a third-generation Christian, at least. I don't know beyond that. But I'm a third-generation Christian on my father's side. And while I am extremely thankful for that, I'm sure I have no comprehension, honestly, of how blessed and fortunate I have been. Do we even partially comprehend this morning what we have been spared from? If we were fortunate enough to be raised in a godly home under the leadership of a godly father, do we have any idea how much potential hurt, how much potential grief, how much potential consequence of sin we have avoided just because our parents were godly individuals who walked in a godly and integrity way? As a pastor, it's been my experience, but I would, it would be everyone's experience over the years. You witness the difficult lives that many have been forced to endure simply because they did not have a Christian father and mother who walked in their integrity. You see the pain, and you see the destruction, and you see the sorrow, and by God's grace, you hope to be able to be some sort of an instrument to help them pick up the pieces and put things together and walk forward in a better way. But again, every time I have a counseling session with someone who's gone through that, I almost always sit down at my desk and just praise God and thank God for what I had. I never knew the pain of alcoholism or drug abuse. I never experienced in my home the shame of infidelity. I never, phys I never had to face physical or emotional abuse. Never was I neglected. Never did I experience a host of terrible things that many children have faced in the past and are ch facing today. You know what I did get to experience? Security. Unconditional love. Faithfulness. Compassionate correction. All the while witnessing a true example of what godly disciplined life actually looks like. In my home growing up, I observed my parents... And in doing so, I learned that God is to be the preeminent thing in our lives. That seeking first God's kingdom isn't just one way to live, it's the only way to live. That the Bible is true, and it's not just a book to be believed, it's a book to live and obey. I learned and witnessed the fact that denying self is not a bad thing, it's actually a good thing and the only thing. I learned through my growing up experience that church is not simply a place to attend, but it's a family to which to belong. I saw by example that serving God by serving others in the church and community was more important and more desirable than seeking any other worldly pleasure or entertainment. I learned these things first and foremost by example. The example of my Christian parents. For today's sermon, specifically the example of my father. Maybe you're sitting here and you say, well, I'm happy for you, but that wasn't my experience, and I'm sad if it wasn't. I wish everybody could have had my experience. But can I say this? Can I encourage you? Despite what your upbringing was, it can be different with you. Surely nobody who maybe was grow were grown up in a bad situation where maybe father and mother weren't saved or maybe they were saved but didn't follow the Lord and we suffered the consequences. Okay, let's say that's a reality. It's unfortunately a reality for a lot, but let me ask you this question, dad especially, but moms as well. If that was your experience, is it your desire to continue that? Is that the way you want to raise your children? Is that what you want to be their heritage? Do you not want something better for the people you love and you care about and that God has given unto you? Is it a time to make a stop and say, okay, it wasn't that way for me, but it is going to be for my kids going forward? I would think all of us would want something better for the ones that we love. 
And it can be better. Maybe you're not fortunate like I was to be a third generation Christian. But if God has saved your soul, start your tradition with you. Be that first generation Christian that establishes the ongoing Christian testimony with your children and then grandchildren and great grandchildren if the Lord so allows. Do we realize, fathers, the blessings that we can provide for our children simply because we know Christ and are walking in his integrity? If you're like me, we look at our current culture and we lament the maladjustment of the children in our world. And I do as well as you. I, look at, I drove a bus for three years when I first came here as your pastor. I sat there in that mirror and watched those kids standing behind me and I shook my head. I could not believe what I was seeing. I could not believe what I was hearing. I could not understand what was going on. I look at these kids and I said, what a bunch of maladjusted children. But you know why they're a bunch of maladjusted children? Because they're living in a home with maladjusted parents. Parents who are not taking the time to show these children who God is and what his purposes are. Most of the time, because they don't know themselves. But what a shame if we do have Christian parents. But for whatever reason, maybe they don't feel comfortable doing it. Maybe they don't feel secure in their ability to do it. But to think that there could be actual Christian parents who somehow are just hoping for the best with their children and not actively seeking to engage in them and help them to walk in this way of integrity that can make all the difference in their life. Yes, the children will answer to God for the decisions they've made and the choices they're making and the sins they're committed. Yes, I'm not trying to take that away. But I wonder sometimes what the parents are going to answer to God for as well. Because the home life that they gave them. Do we not all lament the state of the modern day church? We I wonder what happens with kids when they grow up and they just move on and they don't ever come back. What happened with these people? What is going on? And again, I don't want to say this in such a way that, I, that it's a universal statement. It's not. But I do think we should at least have pause and ask ourselves... Is this at least partially the result of the fact that maybe our children grew up not really understanding how important God was and what he's doing in this earth? Because unfortunately in our lives, we weren't showing how important God was to us in the life that we were living. If we as Christian fathers are sporadic at best in our worship and service to God, what do we suppose our children are going to turn out to be and do? You know the old saying? It's a proverb. Generally true. What we do in moderation, our children will do in excess. If our Christian experience is moderate at best, why do we have any expectation that it's going to be more in the lives of our children? What could possibly be the reason we would think that? So if we love these kids, and we want what's best for these kids, wouldn't that be a driving, motivating factor to say, I've got to be all that God wants me to be, if for no other reason, <laughs> for the sake of my kids? What are they seeing? What are they learning? What is important to them based upon what's important to me? Well, you know, my kids, they only care about spiritual things. They don't even want to learn spiritual things. That may be true, but that may just be indicative of the fact that they've never seen you care about spiritual things. It's not important to you. Why would it be important to them? I grew up with boys my age in church. Their dads were temperate at best in their attendance at church and their attitude toward God. I'm not shocked as they became young men that they walked away from their religion altogether and gone their own way. Why? Why would they not? The man that God had designed to be the person they would look up to the most and would see to be that glowing example of what a man's supposed to be refused to show them a devotion to God. And now they aren't devoted to God either. Why do we think that somehow our kids aren't watching? They aren't listening. They aren't paying attention. They aren't being affected by our choices and our attitudes and our actions. Folks, they are. We want to lay the problem of our nation at the politicians' feet. It's not their fault. It's our fault. It is the fault of God's people who really don't care about God. Why? 
what our families need, what our nation needs, what our world needs, is the right kind of fathers, just men, living the right kind of lives, walking in integrity, so that their children are placed in a favorable position to receive the manifold blessings of God. Dad, is this the kind of father you are? Or let me phrase it this way. Is this the kind of father you're striving to be? I lament the shortcomings that I have displayed in my home, in this area. Oh, how I lament them. If you, again, you know, the old hindsight, if you could go back and change anything, what would you change? You know, some people say, well, I'd have, I'd have bought a different house or I'd have gotten a different job. I, want a different, I wouldn't change any of that stuff. I could care less about that stuff. The thing I lament is the times that I wasted being the kind of example to my kids I could have been and should have been. The times that I walked in my flesh and displayed for my children things that they should not have had to have experienced. As fathers, why don't we attempt to prove the reality of this proverb? To prove it to ourselves, to prove it to our families, to prove it to our churches, to prove it to our communities. Why don't we seek to prove it by going out and saying, God, by your grace, I'm going to be a just man who walks in my integrity. And I believe if we do this, at least Solomon is informing us that we will be placing our children in a favorable position to receive the manifold blessings of God. And I would just say this, dads. If it doesn't mean enough to us personally to put forth this effort to live right, shouldn't we at least be compelled to do it because of our love for them? Our children are counting on us. In the case of this church, our grandchildren are counting on us. Our great-grandchildren are counting on us to do everything within our power to be just men who walk in our integrity. Oh, by God's grace, may it be so. Father, this morning I pray you challenge us with these thoughts from this simple little proverb. Lord, you made it so clear, so succinct, we, we cannot miss it if we have any eyes to see or ears to hear. It's right there before us. Father, this morning, my prayer is that you might stir the hearts of men. The few men that are in this room this morning. I think we look around uh, our church sometimes and get discouraged and maybe have the attitude, the spirit. What's, what's it matter? There's so few of us. We're so insignificant. What does it even matter? And yet, Father, I think verses like this proverb are reminding us we dare not minimize the impact we can have in the most important of places. And if we were able to have this kind of impact in our own homes and send forth a new generation that is both experienced and is seeking after the very same things, Lord, we can have an incredible impact. I don't know that we're going to change the world in which we live. You've not said you're going to change the world in which we live. I'm not looking for that but we certainly have the ability to impact the kingdom of God. And what greater thing could we hope for? Oh, Lord, challenge men today. Challenge fathers today with being just men who walk in their integrity. All this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.